Good evening. My name is William Watkins. I'm the Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students here at Cal State Northridge. And it is indeed my great privilege and honor to welcome you here on this evening and to introduce our program to you, which will feature our distinguished lecturer, Reverend James Lawson. Tonight's presentation is special for several reasons. First, this lecture begins the second semester of a year-long dialogue on our campus that was initiated to explore the principles and actions of nonviolence as a strategy for social change. This lecture series exists in part as a direct response to activism on our campus last year, approximately a year ago now, uh, and the desire of our faculty and students to develop insights and the capacity to use purposeful, meaningful, and effective strategies to promote student access and financial support for higher education. Second, tonight's lecture is extra special in that it occurs during the very month that we celebrate the legacy of that great drum major for peace and justice through nonviolent social action, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Indeed, I believe that this is the first time in many years that we have had some event or activity on our campus to commemorate Dr. King during the month of his celebration. It is especially noteworthy and remarkable that we tonight will be able to have words brought to us by a speaker who in the per person of Reverend Lawson is someone who worked so closely and deeply with Dr. King and was such an integral part of teaching and instructing nonviolence. Finally, the last reason why this occasion is special is that tonight we have in our audience individuals who join us from our community, individuals who have come to our campus on this evening to join with our students in this commemorative lecture. Many of the individuals here tonight are of the clergy. Uh, and we also have a youth group here to my right from the Panorama City area, Positive Alternatives for, for Youth. We're happy to have you here. Let's give a cheer for all of our visitors here tonight. The initiative on social discourse and uh, civil discourse and social change is indeed a campus-wide effort. But two individuals more than others must be singled out for having the vision and doing the work to organize, gain support, and in fact convince Dr. Lawson to join us here this year. I speak of none other than Professor Martha Lopez Garza, who's standing there taking photos. <laughs> and our own Professor Catherine Sorrells, who's on the front here. Let's give them both a cheer. There are other, a number of other sponsors of this initiative from across the campus. They include American Indian Studies, the Art Department, Anthropology, Asian American Studies, Central American Studies, the American Indian Student Association, the Black Student Union, Chicana Chicano Graduate Student Association, CSUN Communication Association, Dreams to be Heard, Gender and Women's Studies Student Association, MECHA, the Performance Ensemble, Women's Research and, Re and Resource Center, and university departments including the College of Humanities, the Mike Herb College of Arts, Media, and Communication, the Office of the Provost, the Office of Student Affairs, Oviatt Library, and United We Serve Our Own volunteer organization. Let's give all of those organizations also a hearty cheer. Events such as this cannot occur without a lot of people behind the scenes. And we're here this evening in your own University Student Union, and we thank them for their sponsorship of this event. We thank Chanel Tyus who uh, has worked so hard to put this event on and to organize it here today. We will keep our remarks very brief because 
Today is, again, a very special opportunity for us. It is remarkable that, and you will certainly discover that in, in your own experience here tonight, that we're able to share an evening with an individual who has such a rich and illustrious history, and quite frankly, with more vitality and energy than most of the people in this room. He travels all over this country, sharing the history and the practice and the principles of nonviolence, and helping us to understand that nonviolence does not mean an absence of action. In fact, in its history, it has been a hallmark for, in fact, action and a catalyst to change. Our students deserve an opportunity to be exposed to the various strategies for going out and doing the work that the public expects of them when they acquire their degrees here. So it is indeed my proud privilege, and I ask that you join me in welcoming now to the stage Reverend James Lawson. appreciate very much that, uh, well, I guess I better turn the mic on. There we go. appreciate very much being here this evening, this afternoon, again at CSUN, uh, California State University at Northridge, and to see uh, those of you who have gathered here, and to see again faces from the last semester as well. Uh, I'm uh, Delighted to be a part of this campus for this for these brief moments. <clears throat> I want to uh, express my appreciation to the university and to that's not on. This this is on uh -huh. um, for inviting me. And uh, I want to again uh, say um, the extent to which. Uh, uh, Professor Caffin and Marta have been uh, such wonderful hosts for the university and have uh, watched over me in a very careful way. They approached me in a workshop um, at Holman United Methodist Church back when? February? March? April. Oh, it was April. <laughs> and said, would I, would I, would I consider uh, being available at, at uh, Cal State? And I said that I would, but what they have done, I think, is really extraordinary, as Vice President Watkins has already said, um, to do this kind of a theme, uh, civil discourse and social change, as a broad campus theme, and to try to encourage uh, faculty and students alike and community alike to be engaged in this conversation it seems to me is really a very, very important contribution of this university to our city and, in fact, to the nature of the discussion that we need to have in this country of ours, the United States. So I'm very grateful for the privilege of being here. Now, I heard good news this evening since I've been here. I want to, I want to say that so because I think it's something we should celebrate. The, the five students who were arrested from CSUN back in March um, did something quite noble this, again this, over this weekend because they were offered that the charges would all be dropped if, um, but not for a fifth student. And uh, those four others, there are five of them been arrested, four of them would be released, that is, the charges would be dropped by the city attorney. Now, in the first place, if the city attorney could drop those charges, that means he should have dropped them already. But they declined because they said the charges should also be dropped against Jose. Now, that, that demonstrates character and solidarity that they were not going to allow division to inter to intersect and to disturb and disunify them. So I want to commend these five students. I know Janae is here. I don't know if any of the four are here, but she's here. Um, 
any others here? I, I, I don't. Justin is not here. Jose is not here. Well, in any, any case, I think that's very, very important. It, it demonstrates, you see, that in all sorts of situations, you and I do have the ability to say yes or no, to say yes according to our best conscience. And that, to me, is, uh, is quite important. Now, as um, we meet this evening, as has already been said, this is, the, is a special event because it is the week of the national holiday of the birth of Martin Luther King Jr. January 15th was his birth and, the, and the, uh, is his actual birth and the 17th was the national holiday. I want to tell you that I, one of the good things that I feel about my country, and when I use the term country, I'm talking about 350, I'm sorry, 300 and approximately 10, though the census for 2010 has not been released, but I'm talking about 205 or 10 or more million people who live in this United States of ours. Um, I feel that in our having this kind of holiday for a civilian, not a president, not a general or an admiral, uh, not somebody who carried on a war as a president. Martin Luther King Jr. was a pastor and philosopher all of his life. He was not a wealthy man at all when he died. He died as a relatively poor man. Um, he had no power except the power of conscience and the power of organizing people for social justice and economic justice. But when uh, the, that holiday is named for a civilian, it's not Memorial Day, which is a war day. It's not Veterans Day, which is a, which is a, a military day. Uh, it's, it's rather a civilian day. It's an important day, and we all must see that it's great that we live in a country where there is a holiday for a civilian whose life was a life of contribution and sacrifice on behalf of eradicating wrong and helping to lift up the right and the true and the wonderful. So um, we should all celebrate it. We should celebrate it as the second American Revolutionary Day. Because I won't say that too much about that, but I, the, the first American Revolution, July 4th, 1776, did create a lofty ideal for the earth, for the human race. I don't know if this is being taught at all in a fashion that is relevant to, to the present period or back then. But then there was literally no place in the world where the concept and the notion that all are created equal, that all have equal rights from creation, not from a government, not by virtue of status or definition of life, but from creation itself. Now, this does, to me, it doesn't matter to me as a pastor whether you believe in God or not, but you have to accept the fact that you did not make yourself and you did not arrive here. Can you hear me up there? 
Oh, okay, good. Um, what I'm trying to say is life, uh, we human beings did not create life. Life is a gift. Whether we know it or not, whether we accept it or not, no one may have the answer to where life came from, your life in particular. But one thing is certain, that it is gift to you, to me. It's not something that I had anything to do with creating. Now that's what that notion way back in 1776 happens to mean. And happens to mean. That all are created equal. All are endowed by the Creator. It doesn't matter whether you call the Creator a life source or God, an impersonal God or a Brahmin or an it. It doesn't matter. What the statement writes is true. You and I have been given life as a gift. We've been given this wonderful planet as a gift. And it's wonderful because it supports our living. And the planet is so wonderful that it nourishes human life, as well as the trees, as well as the bacteria, uh, and all. So, when that was done, we were living in a world that primarily was a world of authoritarianism, tyranny, kings and queens and monarchy, where the aristocracy and the wealthy and the powerful ruled with absolute power, oftentimes announcing that this power comes from God. Well, it, the power of ruling does not come from God. Uh, the power of life does come from creation, life itself. So it's a blessing. And so when that happened, the world um, was not aware of the importance of it. Um, it's important now because for 400 years that notion has been in the stream of the world, in the thought and the mind of so much of the world. Um, the, for, um, it's important for us to understand that op oppression in many forms, control and domination of life is still pretty normal, but the break with that began in the 18th century, and it's up to us, you and I, to continue to build upon it. So a Martin Luther King's Day ought to be a day where we say, a week or a month, however, we ought to say we have to be committed, not primarily to our own well-being, not primarily to our own freedom to speak talk, to act, but to the right of every boy and girl and every man and woman all across our country, their right to life and to the gifts of life and to the access of life. You may or may not know that we do have political prisoners in the United States. We have always had them. This is never talked about in the media. Some of those political prisoners are poor people. Some of those political prisoners are very young people. But we do have political prisoners. We do have more people in jails than any other country in the world. I think that's accurate. 2.3 million people are in jail. Most of them are young and poor and people of color. That is outrageous. It demonstrates the fact that the criminal justice system has become largely a system to oppress and to manage and dominate rather than a criminal justice system for the purpose of protecting and helping us. So for me, this is an, a very creative opportunity for us to celebrate what our problems are, how we face them, and how we can move from where we are as a nation to where we want to be. We are not yet a full democracy. We must understand that. I do not care what Rupert Murdoch and Fox Entertainment tells you. We are not yet a full democracy. There are too many millions and millions of children who do not have access 
too many millions of their mothers who do not have access. There are too many working people who only earn wages of poverty rather than wages that allow them to keep food and clothing and medical attention in their families. Too many millions of us uh, in the United States do not earn enough from our work to be able to support and sustain ourselves and our families. So we do have problems. But the task of becoming fully a society where there is access of equality, liberty, and justice for all is still the big task of this generation uh, here in the United States as well as around the world. Now, I, the third thing in the beginning I want to say is that the holiday is also a very personal matter with me because as has been said already, um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and I uh, had an association of uh, some 11 years of his 13 years of, of, of public life, of, of uh, church life. And I want to describe that very briefly, if I can, to begin uh, the, to, to, to launch what I will say uh, throughout the evening. I met racism in the streets of Massillon, Ohio, around the, age, around the age of four. And in meeting it, determined while in primary school, that I was going to, indeed, resist it and fight it. I knew then that I was a child of creation. I was a child of God, is the way my parents put it. It's the way the church that sustained and nurtured me as a boy, and as a young person, put it. That's the way the church put it. So racism, in my mind, was an insult that could not harm me, but an insult that not, should not be alive in our society. So I proceeded to begin to fight it and resist it in every way that I knew how. Uh, I learned to do this through compassion and truth rather than by imitating it. And it's, to make a long story short, this is in some of the books about my life but I had an encounter with my mother in the fourth grade. And that encounter convinced me I could no longer fight racial slurs and racism and prejudice with my fists, but that I could fight it with my mind and my heart and with my character and with courage. I didn't have to become a racist to fight racism did not have to become a prejudiced person to stop prejudice, which would not stop it. So I determined that I would fight it then by truth and by some, time, some moments of boldness on the part of my own life. When I went to college in 1947, uh, I was told that this was pacifism, and I joined a pacifist group. But then it was felt in the conversations that pacifism did not have power, pacifism was far more peaceful than I was. <laughs> I was an athlete, I loved to play, and I played hard. Um, but then, in that same year, 1947, I read Gandhi, Mo Mohandas K. Gandhi of India for the first time. If you have never read anything about Gandhi or by Gandhi, I would urge you to do it because he was one of the extraordinary human beings of the human race. One of those extraordinary moments in the, tw in the 20th century. But as I read Gandhi, I recognized that what Gandhi was doing in South Africa and then later in India was what I was trying to do, nonviolent struggle, nonviolent resistance, nonviolent conflict. I'll even use this kind of a word, though I don't like it as well, nonviolent warfare.
And in those years in college, I then determined that black people in the United States, if they began to learn nonviolent struggle and action, direct action, uh, it would mean that we could speed up this process of our nation dismantling racism and violence, economic disorder and dysfunctionality, and we could create a better society. So I believed um, that nonviolence would work in the future and that it could change America. So I had ambitions and aspirations for a Martin Luther King Jr. before I knew his name and before we had a chance to meet. I met him for the first time on the pages of the Nagpur Times around December the 6th, 1955, in Nagpur, India. I was in Nagpur, India, where I lived for three years as a coach, phys ed teacher, and as a campus minister at Hislop College, a part of the University of Nagpur in Nagpur, India. In the morning paper in 1955, December, was delivered to my veranda, and when I picked it up, there on the front pages, was the headline, 50,000 Negroes boycott in Montgomery, Alabama. And that really excited me. I won't go into this story very much, but it was one of the days I will never forget, because it was the day that I'd been hoping and praying for. Because I, like Martin Luther King, I believe that when there are injustices, the injustice is not going to go away by itself. People have to decide to change it. Time is not going to do very much about anything unless there's active, positive effort to let time be used to create social change. And so I literally shouted on the day that I met King, and I followed him then in the press, Newsweek, Time Magazine, British Broadcasting Company, All India Radio, in many newspapers of, of different languages in the state, in the nation, rather. I followed in the New York Herald Tribune, which was an international paper in English. I followed the Montgomery bus boycott. I thought I came to know him fairly well through the press. Just as today, we think we come to know different public figures that we see through seeing them on television and reading about them and so forth and so on. Well, I shook Martin King's hand the first time, February the 6th, 1957, in Ohio, when I had returned to the country, to our country, and was in the graduate school at Oberlin. Uh, Ohio. And in the process of our conversation, we discovered we were the same age, uh, among other things. He was 82, January the 15th. I was 82, September the 22nd. We discovered we were both third generation clergy. We discovered we knew some of the same people from books and from the churches. And he was quite excited about the fact that I had just returned from India after three years, where one, I, one of the things I did was to follow the footsteps of Gandhi around India. Because you may or may not know that Gandhi is the father of India, a country of 350 million people that at, back then, 1947, and through nonviolent struggle, Gandhi became the first person, the first leader, and the Indian people became the first people to begin to cause the British Empire to come. Can you still hear me? Hear me? Okay, good. 
All right, anyway, the British Empire, it was said, um, the sun never set in the British Empire. It was the number one empire up to the 20th century, and including parts of the 20th century. You had the Dutch Empire, the Belgium Empire, the German Empire, the French Empire. European countries pretty much control and dominate it. Asia, Africa, South America, and the like. Through the expansion 500 years ago, the exploration and conquest and the search for gold 500 years ago. Well, Gandhi began by his work to predict that the empires must Van be vanquished. The empires must leave. And he did it through nonviolent struggle. They never fired a shot at a British soldier. But in August of 1947, they raised the flag of their own country over the India. The United States didn't much like it. Churchill of Great Britain detested it. But a country set out to become a democratic society um, in that year. So Dr. King was interested in that and so forth and so on, interested in the fact that I'd been practicing and working on nonviolent struggle and understanding for some 10 years by that time. Can you still hear me up there? OK, good. So that's that. That's what we shook hands for the first time. And when I said that one day when I finished graduate degrees, I might move south. I'm sorry. Martin King said to me across the table very gently and quietly, but it was one of those moments that I knew a decision was being made for me that I hadn't anticipated at that time. He said, don't wait. Come now, come now, we need you now. He said, come now. So I heard myself quietly saying, though I had no idea what that meant, that I will come as soon as I can. Um, and so in January of 1958, I was in, I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, to begin working in the whole emerging movement, and I worked full time. Uh, I, 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 traveled all around the southeast. I did my first workshop for Dr. King in January of 1958. I met the Little Rock Nine. How many of you know the Little Rock Nine? I see a few hands. Well, these were high school students in Little Rock, Arkansas. As school desegregation began in the south, and it's hard to put this in context to tell you that in those years we um, in, in those years, um, segregation hasn't finished yet in the United States, and I don't want to pretend it has. But in the southeastern part of the country, segregation was by law, by custom, always enforced by the police. And when the Supreme Court on May the 17th, 1954, said that Segregated education is unequal education and therefore unconstitutional. This meant that schools were supposed to begin the process of diversifying, dismantling the segregation and principles and structures. That job, that task has not yet been finished in the United States or done in many parts of the United States at all. In any case, in Little Rock, Arkansas, 85 black students volunteered to desegregate the school system of Little Rock. There were all black schools, all white schools. Those are the only two categories at that time. That's changed now. There's a sizable growing Hispanic population in Arkansas that wasn't there in 1954. Well, when those nine students, the school board was chicken, you know, cowardly, I should say. So 85 students volunteered 
and they would only allow nine. And instead of desegregating several schools, they desegregated initially only one school, one of the best high schools in the country at that time, Little Rock, called Central High. And so they put nine black students in that school with a student body of about 1,500 people. And you don't know some of these terms, but under segregation, a lot of white people organized in places like Little Rock to say desegregation is never going to happen. And so they convinced students in that high school to try to drive these nine black students out of the high school. And these black students, nine of them, essentially determined that we're going to do this, we're going to resist this, but we're going to fight back, but we're not going to fight back using the hatred and the violence that was used against them. That's a rather courageous thing. But the nine did this. So I had the chance to meet the, all nine of them in 1958 and give them workshops on nonviolent resistance, nonviolent self-defense, nonviolent theory and practice. Um, I traveled um, all across the South. Martin King and I walked in many places together, Jackson, Mississippi, Little Rock, Arkansas, Nashville, Tennessee, Montgomery, um, Alabama. I organized the campaign in 1959-60 in Nashville, Tennessee that Martin King called the Model Movement. It became the, became the model for our work in Albany, Georgia, in Birmingham, Alabama, in Memphis, Tennessee, and a variety of other places. So. This meant that I lived and worked with him in many, many places. Um, it is said that Dr. King uh, waited too late to speak out on the Vietnam War. That's nonsense. I know better than that. Because we always taught, we taught in our workshops that American foreign policy in Angola, Africa, and in Vietnam, and in Nicaragua was a bad foreign policy. I taught this myself, so I know um, the foreign policy is all, has been atrocious a good part of my life. The foreign policy practices have been terrible. Most of them have been too much violence. So some of the academic people say, well, King was silent too long and Martin King didn't like his silence, but he was not silent. We talked about it in various places. In 1965, in May, when I was a pastor in Memphis, Tennessee, Martin King called me one morning without my knowing about it. And, and we talked about Vietnam for about the better part of three hours on that phone call. Because he was being invite, invited to go to Southeast Asia with a clergy team from Canada and Europe. And he insisted that 1965 he should not go. And then he asked me if, you, if I would go in his place. And I said I would, though I didn't know again how I would do it. But he said, uh, I'm going to tell the group that you're going to go and will report to me about Vietnam and Southeast Asia. That was 1965. He would not speak out about that time because... It was not the right moment to try to get the country to see that seeking justice in the United States, freedom and justice on the part of poor people and black people in the United States had similar concerns with the United States as the people in Vietnam who were seeking to throw off the French Empire. And I had followed that in World War II as a high school student. So I knew about some of that. Um, then in 1966, uh, we ha I have pictures in my archives of Martin King and I walking in the Mississippi Road going to Jackson, uh, Mississippi in the March Against Fear. Um, 
where we, in fact, were accosted by state highway patrolmen who uh, were very, very upset. Because, uh, and I'll say this, I'll say this in a loving fashion. Um, these policemen, state highway patrolmen, were always white. They were white on that particular day. They were men, all men. And they were trained on beating the heads of black people, especially black men. They had never had the experience at all of standing on a highway with people like Martin King and Stokely Carmichael and Bob Green and Jim Lawson who looked them in the eyes and said we had a right to walk on the shoulder and that we were going to walk. They had never had that kind of experience. And I watched one of them who literally stood there with his hand on his holster and shook. I mean, he was shaking. His face turned all kinds of colors. If there had been the slightest kind of movement on any of our parts that looked even looked possibly as though we might raise a hand to them, that man would have pulled that pistol and emptied it on us. That was 66 and 66 and 67. We had a movement in Chicago, Illinois, and I went there as a volunteer staff person every week to help that struggle. So again, these are some of my connections with King. Then in 9th, March of 1960, in February of 1968, I was in Memphis, Tennessee as a pastor when 1,300 mostly black workers who were called garbage workers walked off the job. The job was horrible. They made poverty wages. They had no medical benefits whatsoever. They had to use their own clothes. And it was a day when there were no trucks that picked up the garbage cans. They had to go into the backyards and pick up garbage, garbage cans and then carry them and dump them in the truck dirty, despicable work, and then they were not paid for it. And then they were mistreated. And so when they began to, when they called a strike among themselves, I supported it and walked with them. And the city government would not listen, would not negotiate, would not make any effort to change or understand those men. So finally we had to organize an economic boycott daily marches, mass meetings, and to the mass meetings we invited a variety of people, but down the road we invited Dr. King to come and speak. And some of you may have seen those films. Well, one of the reasons I happen to believe the five students about the misbehavior of the police on the campus is because I've watched police misbehave in Danville, Virginia, in St. Augustine, Florida, in Nashville, Tennessee, in Memphis, Tennessee, and elsewhere all across the South. In Memphis, Tennessee at this time, a group of us are walking down the street peacefully, and the police broke up our march with mace cans, gassing us in the face and in the ears, and broke up the march of about 12, 1,300 people. So I have seen police riot against black people. Uh, I have watched police act arrogant and authoritarianly in various places. So anyway, um, Dr. King and I talked at length about the, about the sanitation strike. And we were at that time organizing the Poor People's Campaign, and we agreed that the strike was an important part of organizing the people's, poor people's campaign. And the net result was that he came to Memphis on two or three occasions and was then assassinated there. I saw him on the day of assassination for about four or five hours. I spent much of the morning with him talking strategy and where, where we were going and 
then that afternoon, uh, I came back from a federal court hearing that I've been a witness for the, for the movement. And we talked some more. Um, and I left him around 4 o'clock that afternoon, and he was assassinated around 6 o'clock, 10 minutes to 6 maybe. So this holiday is not, uh, is not an impersonal affair to me. It is a personal affair. But of course, when I say personal, I want you to understand that that also means it's spiritual. <laughs> it's political. It's social. The, the idea that, you know, if it's personal, therefore, it has nothing to do with politics. That's baloney. That's wrong. Nonsense. The difficulty very much in the politics of the United States is that it's not personal enough for the elected officials. If they decided that they would pass laws and approach problems as they try to approach their sons and daughters or like their wives and spouses as they do their close friends, we would have a different quality of politics all across the United States, almost immediately. But this is part of the way in which contemporary society wants us to be alienated from our own lives. Nonviolence is a philosophy that insists that what is most important about you is always the way in which you work to live day by day and conduct and handle your life. If you know in your life love and compassion and friendship and care, nonviolence says, don't become an enemy because you run into a calamity or a difficulty somewhere along the way. Continue to be a person who wants friendship wants to give friendship as the center of your life. That's a part of the way of talking about nonviolence. I want to briefly um, finish this lecture. Finish means maybe another 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> By using as my theme a theme that came out of the movement in the 60, in 67 and that you can find in the book that Dr. King wrote in, 60, uh, in 66, published in 67. And that theme I'm going to use is, where do we go from here, chaos or community? Where do we go from here, chaos or community? And I want to just simply say to you, that was a theme of what is called the Civil Rights Movement. Many, many times, I think we do not understand the spectrum and the, you know, the incredible experience that, was, that we cluster now in the term um, the Civil Rights Movement. There were many different dimensions of it. Um, it was one of the most exciting periods of life that I've ever had. Um, the people from around the southeast particularly, my friends, my family, the intensities of the challenges that we faced. Now, calling it the civil rights movement tends to, to make it less than what it was and what it must mean in the future, tends to suggest that it was primarily about black people. It wasn't. It's was about racism and the poverty and the violence of racism, the sexism of racism. On the local sceneries where we operated, we talked much more about freedom and justice and equality. We talked much more about quality schools for every boy and girl. We talked much more about jobs where people could make a good living as well as make a good life for themselves and their families. We talked about the need for affordable housing and the rest. So civil rights meant for us basically the right of every man and woman to live 
and to carry on their lives as creation wants them to carry on that life. This is what makes our dissay so distressful, the chaos that happened on January the 9th in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, with the shooting of Gabrielle uh, Giffords, the congresswoman from Tucson, and the killing of some six other people, wounding of some uh, 13 other people, uh, wounding 13 people, killing six people, including a nine-year-old girl by the name of Christina Green, including a judge, John Rowles. Now, there's no, no use us talking about this as though this represents uh, just the way things are. It doesn't. It represents the way we have allowed things to become. I want you to understand that. In, 19, in the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, I do not remember a single killing in that fashion that we seem to have now several a year in the last decade or last 20 years. That's chaos. When you have elected officials talking about, well, you can't do anything about guns, well, what are the possibilities that when a 22-year-old boy, and I say boy, 22, he's a young adult, but he's at the beginning of his life still, Jared Lee Lautner is vulnerable. He needed to be, he needed to have mental health treatment. He, he was not crazy, but he had disturbing things in his mind, in his spirit, in his experience that he did not know how to handle in any way except the way he used, get a gun. Does that, do you understand that up there? Now, we all know, do we not, how sometimes we can be very confused. Is that right? How many of us can get confused? I can, and I'm 82. <laughs> and not sure what to do. And when that happens, we need family. We may need to talk to a counselor. We may need a good teacher to help us, or a pastor, but we all have situations where we need assistance in life. Well, how is it possible that we can have a society when a 22-year-old young person knows he's in trouble and cannot get help? Then how is it possible to have a society that such a person can then go and buy an assault weapon and growing men act as though well he had a right to the assault weapon he had maybe a right he did not in my judgment have a right to an assault weapon assault weapons were banned in the United States until 2007 when the ban had to be renewed and President George Bush and the Democrats in Congress let the ban end so you could buy the assault weapon. Ask yourself the question, why did not the President of the United States and the Congress, Republicans and Democrats alike, not renew that a ban that made it illegal for assault weapons to be sold in the United States. And then the third thing I want to say about Tucson as a sign of chaos in our society is this. I heard a news reporter on television news, and I don't watch television news that much, but on the evening of that, this National Network reporter in Tucson said that a president, apparently the federal judge who was killed that 
afternoon was um, in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, the federal judge is an adult, and uh, I have not heard very much discussion about this, but I happen to think, you see, that the governors and the legislators and the mayors and the police chiefs, for the most part, are avoiding the issue. We're supposed to be a law and order society, and a law and order society means that Christina Green and Judge John Rolls should have been allowed to be where they were without the possibility of someone having an assault weapon coming into their corner and intruding into their lives and destroying their right to life. I think that that's the kind of chaos that in our time will increase unless we can have a different temperament in our society. And the movement asked the question back then, where do we go from here? Do we want increasing chaos, mayhem, violence? Or do we want to be a community not just a community here at CSUN, but do we want our nation to become a community? And what does it take to become a community that looks out for itself and for one another? Which is why in the, in the movement in the southeastern part of the country, um, I taught that the purpose of our struggle is to build what we call the beloved community. Now, I borrowed the phrase beloved community from people around 1903 in the United States because there was an important movement out of the churches that tried to stop child labor especially children worked in coal mines at the turn of the century for 12 or 16 hours a day and maybe got 10 cents an hour. Or in a shoe factory in Boston or in steel mills, children, that is 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year old kids were not in school. They worked in factories, many of them helping their families, of course, with their work. With no safety laws, and really no pay. Uh, so there were a whole variety of people from different churches and religious groups and political groups that, that worked together very hard to change those, change the laws to, to prevent childlike labor in that form. And they talked about, we want the United States to become a beloved community. They talked about the fact that they wanted our society, all the millions of us, to become connected to each other by law, by customs that connected us in respect and, and all, with dignity for, for one another. A beloved community is a community where problems are not seen as a means to get elected to office. We human beings in every century, in every generation, we've had our own problems. And we are where we are today in 2011 because the previous generations of human beings adapted, were flexible, learned, and kept striving on. We, we, we are here because of the million-year journey of human beings who did not see problems something to run away from, but as something to face, saw problems in ways by which they would be improved and in which their, their village or their cave would be improved. The beloved community is one where we think that healing can go on. 
inner healing as well as physical healing. We human beings have a miraculous body. It has in it a healing system. Health care and healing is a human right that everyone should have. Government doesn't give it, nor does big capitalism give it. It's your right. The insurance companies have no right to deprive the American people of health care because some people may have a chronic condition of illness. In our society, you never hear, I'm, not, I'm sure that Cal State University is different, people talking about, well, this is a problem that can be solved. We can be healed. What, what I want to push very hard is that we can be healed of our violence as a people, we as a nation. We can be healed of our chaos, of racism, of sexism. And I keep saying racism and sexism because I think these are two major isms in our society that influence too many people and misshape us, misdirect our energy as human beings. A beloved community is where people work together for the larger good of the community. It is time for there to be a spiritual and moral and verbal revolution in our nation where we say to the political parties and to the corporations that control them, it's more important that we solve our problems than it is that you get elected to office. If you're going to be in office, you should be a person who helps us as a people, whether at the local level, a campus, a church, a community, a small town, a big city, or a big country. We have the resources and the possibilities of having a society of the beloved community. So that's why, that's why uh, Dr. King and, uh, adopted as the emerging movement nonviolent struggle and orientation. Now, some people say, well, Dr. King, <clears throat> um, was a usurper. <laughs> but I want to tell you the story how his name and his person came into being and power in the United States. December 1, 1955, Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama. How many of you know that story? Good. Good, good, good. It's a story for us to know. All right, anyway, you know the story. As a consequence, some women especially told the whole community, let's boycott the buses on Monday, the December 5th. And that's what happened on Monday, December 5th. Uh, this large sizable black community in Montgomery, Alabama, boycotted, stayed off the buses. And then that, that afternoon, as about a hundred or so people were gathered, um, had called a quick meeting of Negro leaders to talk about the boycott and what the next steps are, they quickly decided to do something that a movement has to do. They structured. They said, we will be the Montgomery Improvement Association, the MIA. And they said, let's, let's elect officers. And Martin Luther King Jr. was nominated to be the president of that boycott. And he accepted the nomination. Though he does write, <laughs> I wasn't. I was reluctant. I hadn't planned to do this. Well, you know, some of the best things in the world happen to us when we're prepared, though we had not planned it. <laughs> and he said later that his going to school, doing a college degree, doing a master's degree in theology, and then doing a PhD in theology at Boston University was his preparation for that moment, December the 5th, 1955, 
He didn't know about it as he was going to school at all. But when those people nominated him, and those 40 or 50,000 people in Montgomery said, yes, you are to be our organizer and mobilizer and spokesperson and symbol. You help us make this happen. and Help us make this happen successfully. He was ready to learn how to do it, and he did it. So that's a very good word. Nowadays, sometimes we're told as young people, well, you need a degree if you're going to get a job, but you better think something else than that. Maybe a degree can help you become a more competent man or woman 20 years from now. Maybe that's the reason you're not, we need to be educated. You don't know what will be going on in your journey of life, but if you have cultivated your mind and your heart, your spirit, your friendships, your family. If you learn to do good work here in these years of your life, you help to learn lessons and prepare your mind for the unexpected. And none of us really know what tomorrow will bring. So, he was ready. He was a wonderful speaker. He was a family man. He was a good pastor. He had a wonderful mind. He had a great spirit. Because a holiday is named after him, we think, you know, well, he's some kind of special. But Martin King always walked with a great degree of humble striving to be a person. He was a person who loved to laugh and to play jokes on people. He had a wonderful voice. He loved to sing. He loved music. He loved to dance. He loved to eat. Pickled pig feet was one of his favorite. That's a delicacy on, in the South, you see. Pickled pig feet was something that Martin King liked to eat. Uh, he was a good athlete, good swimmer. In fact, once he saved a staff member from drowning in the pool, he was the only one who noticed that this person was in trouble in the deep water and was literally drowning, and he pulled her out. He loved football and basketball. He loved to run. He did not have all the time he wanted to have with his children, but when he was home, he played and tussled with his four kids at this time in, in, in the 60s. So he was a, a, a one of the extraordinary men of the 20th century. And he became a powerful voice around the world. When I traveled in Africa, I found pictures of Martin Luther King on mud, mud walls, on the walls that were made of mud in mud houses in places like what is now Uganda and Kenya uh, and in the Congo. When I traveled in the South Africa, uh, in not South Africa, but in South America, Paraguay, in the 60s to, to join a workshop on nonviolence, the most important question they were asking was, how did Martin King do this? And so forth and so on. So I'm saying all of that to try to get you to recognize that, that while there's a holiday named after Martin King, Martin King at one time was exactly like you high school people in a high school struggling and the rest of it. He was exactly like us in so many different ways. And we must not see Martin or Gandhi or Jesus and some of the extraordinary people of the human race as somehow being different from our own flesh and blood, our own possibilities. So the movement had great possibilities. I 
just would tell you one other story, one other incident. Nine, we had campaign, campaigns, more campaigns than I can remember, um, uh, year after year. This is um, a, a campaign you're going to hear about because there's a movie made on it. There's a film on uh, national television that's going to be shown in May. It's been shown in some theaters already in the country on the Freedom Ride. So let me tell, that was the year of 1961. This is the 50th year. The Freedom Ride was a simple, simple affair. And uh, 61 was not the first time. The first Freedom Ride in the United States were in the 18, 1840s. Uh, in in uh, Pennsylvania, in New England, Massachusetts, <laughs> New York. The first freedom rides were, were in 1840s because a lot of us Americans have been aware that society was not living up to its claim. And so in many gen different generations, people have worked to make a difference and to change. So the first freedom rides were 1840, not 1961. But in any case, in 1961, Freedom Ride was a very simple thing. Sixteen people began May 4th in Washington, D.C., and they went on Greyhound and Trailway buses down the coast through North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Georgia, Alabama. Now, that was dangerous business because the buses were all segregated. Now, the segregated buses were unconstitutional. There had already been a decision by the Supreme Court that a bus company taking someone from Washington, D.C. to Durham, North Carolina, could not have segregated signs in it. You could, not have a bus, you could not have a bus station that was segregated. You had to treat every customer with dignity, regardless of who they were. But the changes had not occurred. And so the bus, drive, the bus riders who were an integrated group, there were a handful of students, but the rest were adults. When they reached Alabama, a white Ku Klux Klan mob burned the bus. Seriously injured one or two people, gave all of them smoke, uh, damage in their lungs, their bodies, but they managed to go on and take the bus to Birmingham, where, when that bus reached Birmingham, Alabama, the police didn't like this ride taking place, so the police cooperated with the White Citizens Council and the Ku Klux Klan, so a large white mob, and there are films on this, attacked the bus and seriously injured, at that time, the 13 riders. Two of my friends from Nashville were injured on that, in that particular bus stop. Well, the bus riders, now number 13, were so injured and demoralized that they decided they could not go on. And so they voted to end the ride in Birmingham, Alabama. But in Nashville, Tennessee, where we had a strong nonviolent understanding and discipline, we decided, from, our, from the teaching that I'd done in Nashville over the months, that we could not allow a burned bus or a mob in Birmingham to stop this peaceful demonstration. The First Amendment says that you and I have the right for peaceful demonstrations. Assembly is the word. We have that right. Now, oftentimes, the police no longer honor that right. But one of the things that has to happen in the 21st century is that we have to recover that right for all kinds of people and groups. <clears throat> Now, 
when you had this demonstration in March in 2010, you had so many police around, because that's the way in which elected officials have decided that, that they want to manage the demonstration and control it. They don't know that in the movement that I was a part of, we knew how to manage and control a demonstration far better than the police did and without violence. So in any case, we in Nashville determined we cannot let the bus freedom ride stop. And so we voted together as a movement to pick up the bus ride and continue. So we sent in the night. It's a, it's a funny story, but I won't try to tell it all. But in the night, in the middle of the night, we sent the first group of volunteers to go to Birmingham to take the bus to Montgomery. And we called Dr. King, we called Congress of Racial Equality, and we called the Attorney General of the country, Robert Kennedy, and said the demonstration of the Freedom Ride is not over, we're going to continue it. Now, I suggest you see that for yourself. But 55, the bus boycott. 60 was the sit-in campaign all around the country. 61, the Freedom Ride. And what happened about all of that is this. You now can fly on an airplane, ride a bus, a train, a boat, and the country pretty largely now accepts the fact that every citizen has the right of transit, transportation, with dignity, without being interfered with by the police or by anyone else. That did not exist just a few years ago in the United States. But the, this is one of the things that the movement helped to accomplish. I want to say a second thing that the movement under Dr. King accomplished. We got the first immigration bill in 1965 passed, not by lobbying Congress, but by marching in the streets. Boycotts, disobedience, civil disobedience, jail going, and the rest of it. Until 1965, the immigration in the United States was only from Europe and white countries. The 1965 immigration bill did not do enough, but what it did do, however, is that it said that Mexico had a, a number of visas that they could tap and could come to the United States on their own to, for immigration purposes. So immigration purposes were passed to the countries of color for the, for the first time in the history of the nation. You can go and check this out. This is why immigration is very important. And it's why I at least maintain that there, there is no such thing in the sight of God or creation as an illegal or undocumented human being or illegitimate human being. That's nonsense. That's, that's crazy. Uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations declares that the right of people for mobility, immigration, migration, with the society seeing to it that it can be done uh, in a fashion that people can exercise their rights. It's why every issue is important for human well-being. When we recognize the King holiday, we should recognize the movement. Because what happened in those years could never have happened without millions and millions of people, young and old, even children. We had eight-year-old children who insisted that they were going to be arrested in the Birmingham, Alabama campaign. Eight years old. Nonviolent struggle is a struggle for all, all kinds of people in all age groups. So eight-year-olds could participate. They may not be able to understand clearly, but they knew 
that they were working for what one child said was feed them. Um, the movement and King have to be linked. The movement elected him. He applied his own character and ability to the struggle. He's the one who named it nonviolent struggle, nonviolent movement. There are a lot of reasons why that was important. But the most important reason is this that if we're going to make change in our country, it cannot be done by violent language. It cannot be done by violent thoughts and ideology. And it cannot be done by the fist or the sword or the gun or the spear or the bomb. If we're going to have social change. It must be done if you want justice, if you want freedom if you want equality, if you want access, if you want opportunity, it must be done in such a fashion that the community itself is transformed. Martin Luther King Jr. must be honored for the movement. Secondly, he must be honored for nonviolence. We, the human race, are going to commit suicide unless we can bring the violence in the world under control. We in the United States are going to be bankrupt and collapse unless we can bring our troops away from 130 countries in the world and our military bases home. When the Congress talks about finances, they never talk about the finances of the wars. And the wars are the biggest drain on the economy of the United States in two ways. One, because the trillion dollars is spent on an Afghan, a trillion dollars spent on an Afghan war, a large percentage of that trillion dollar goes to General Electric, to the war profiteers. And it doesn't bring peace, doesn't change the problems, doesn't make a better Afghan or a better United States. Let me just quickly read something to you that King said about violence that is so important. Violence, is a, violence as a way of achieving racial justice, and one can add gender justice, economic justice, political justice. Violence as a way of achieving justice is both impractical and immoral. It is impractical because it is a descending spiral ending in destruction for all. The old law of an eye for an eye leaves everybody blind. Violence is immoral because it thrives on hatred rather than love. It destroys community, and makes brotherhood, sisterhood impossible. It leaves society in a monologue rather than a dialogue. Violence ends by defeating itself. It creates bitterness in the survivors, and brutality in the destroyers. We have spent in the United States alone for the last 40 years, we have spent something in the neighborhood of $30 trillion for war making. And we're engaged today in fighting in the Congo, in Yemen, in Afghan, Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Colombia, in the Philippines, and I'm not sure how many other countries where we have troops on the ground engaged in fighting. King said something like this, that given the success of knowledge on the part of the human race and the invention of vast technologies, the question in the future is rather coexistence or co-annihilation. Your generation will be among the generations around the, around the world. The decision to give up on violence, to use nonviolence personally, and to use nonviolent struggle socially and politically as the way to create change. 
So, how do we make this holiday a monument to the development of our democracy? We do it by committing ourselves as persons to continue the struggle for justice in every sphere of human life. We do it by continuing to insist personally that our lives will be engaged in creating community, family, let it go in co-circles, co-centric circles until it embraces the whole human race. We do it by committing ourselves to peace, not to war, to compassion, not to hatred, to character, not cowardliness. You have tools that I did not have in 1945. We have a whole history now of nonviolent struggle in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in the United States, in Latin America. Nonviolent struggles that are going on even as we gather here, Tunisia, where millions of people in the street from all walks of life <coughs> cause the government a dictator, a friend of France and a friend of the United States. Cause the dictatorship to collapse. And they're in the process now of forming a new government. So what I say to you, you have richer, better tools than we had in the 1940s. <clears throat> I invite you personally to honor Martin Luther King Jr. and the movement by deciding that your life will be one singular life that lives love and peace and truth and the infinite worth of your own life and the life of all other people of adopting nonviolence for the way in which you will work and live. You will you will you will you will be surprised at what your life will be. Thank you. I've got this will do this. We're going to take questions if you want to stay. Uh, Reverend Lawson is going to take questions on either side if you now, want to someone, line up. <clears throat> those who have to leave, I invite you to go ahead and leave. You're going to do it anyway. But <clears throat> those who want to maybe talk a little bit, please come forward or from where you are, and we will, we will entertain comments or questions. There is a microphone here, and there's a microphone here. No, that's enough. Thank you. Yeah. Uh. All right, we have people at the mics. And we're going to start because Hello. we only have about 15 minutes to do this. Um, I'll go ahead and start. All right. Who's there? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you could please explain um, the arrest of the CSUN students. I know I turned to my student, at least one of my students, and asked her if she knew what you were talking about, and she didn't. So could you please explain what the arrests were about? Uh, yeah, they're here now. Janine is here. Justice is here. Oh. What the arrests were about. Okay. You now found that out only 
last Friday. They found it out only last Friday. Right. <laughs> right. In our system, in our system, when police want to control and manage a demonstration, you never know what the arrests are going to be about. Right. And they really did not know until Friday. And what was the charge? So originally, all the students were given a blanket charge yes. of, of failure to disperse. Failure. So we're going to back up. So I'll give you a brief history. Failure um, to disperse. Failure to disperse. Yeah. Um, the students, over 7,000 people were out there on March 4th, and they rallied against the budget cuts and for education. Um, the students, um, at the end of the day, came to the intersection of Reseda and Prairie, where it wasn't just students, it was a mix of community members, faculty members, children. It was, um, it was a, uh, a peaceful protest. Um, there were five students who were arrested, and during a couple of the arrests, the protest was at the protesters were chanting peaceful protest. And there's videos and on phones and on YouTube yeah. that also demonstrate this. Now, the police were also responsible for the injury of one 73-year-old professor. She's part superhero. Uh, and she's um, Dr. Olson uh, in the back there. And we love her. Um, yeah, thankfully, she is recovering, and um, when she went to um, receive assistance for her medical health care, she filed a lawsuit against the, um, the police agencies that were responsible for her injuries. In turn, the CSUN police, in an attempt to cover their actions, they blamed the victims and upped the charges on the victims to include battery. So now, the CSUN 6... We are facing, um, all, we're all facing charges in court, and um, our next court hearing is on February 16th. So, yeah. and uh, and uh, they they would uh, they would drop all the charges against four of you, but they wanted to leave the charge of battery on Jose. Right, and yeah. so um, originally originally um, yeah. there was this really stern, hard rock face, yeah. saying that no um, protesters and civil disobedience is not the way to go about this. They equated us to um, the looters and rioters after the Lakers games. But this, there's a large difference in celebration Absolutely. for a Lakers game sure. as for education and for your future. Yeah. And so um, we are here trying to voice, um, give a voice to the voices for those not even protesting, for those who can't afford tuition that are still here, but for those that we don't hear from anymore, from the students that aren't here, from the faculty that have been fired. And so that's, that's why we protest as well. Yeah. I, I did have a question for you. Yeah. Um, well, we, maybe there's other questions about this now, so okay. we might want to, any, anything? <clears throat> now, as they, as they talk to, as I've talked to them over the last semester, they were leaving when the police ordered, they were backing up when the police ordered dispersal. And then the police, the police really instigated their arrest. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Okay, who said that? Yes, okay.
Exactly. Very, very good. Appreciate that comment. That's exactly right. One of the tasks we have is to help the police become servants of a community where people are treated with dignity and, and peace. And we've often had to try to educate police. It has The job is incomplete. So perhaps one of the things you on campus may want to do is to figure out exactly what police, what training police are taking. You may want to decide how that training is insufficient because most of the police training is with about the gun and not interpersonal relationships in interpersonal communities. And I've talked to policemen across now 40 or 50 years, and um, uh, so many of the police officers I've talked to, members of my congregations, have said that if you're going to be a police officer, the most important, m most important gift and duty is your responsibility to be able to, 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 to stand in harmony with all sorts of people which you, with whom you must work and can work. Not arrogantly, but as a friend. So nonviolence <clears throat> non does believe very strongly in retraining the police where that's necessary. And that's necessary in many places. In Los Angeles, I, I've been on the police brutality case cases. In fact, I've just been handed two more since I've been home. And uh, it's a hard task. Police still need basic re-education about what it costs, what it does, what policing is about. All right, second, second person. Go ahead. Then we'll come back to your question. Um, it has come to my attention, or it's kind of been my, my realization over um, the course of my college career, which has spanned most of the Great Recession thus far, that although we have, we as a generation have better tools, better technologies than any generation before us, um, that we are a generation without attention. With, we, we may get direction momentarily, but we do not stay focused. And I remember reading Dr. King's letters from uh, Alabama jail, and he said that one of the principles of organization is focusing the message. And I just, there's so many things, there's so much, I, I, I don't want to use the word evil in the world, but that's pretty much what you have. I mean, that's the best word for it that I know of. Um, corruption, failure, you know, the state. Um, where do we focus the attention? Where do we start? Because we, I don't know. Where do you start? Do you want to answer that, Justin? Start right now. I think we, all of us start with ourselves. If you're going to reach out into some kind of social action, social justice, you talk with your friends and whatnot, you investigate that issue, make a decision together, what can we do? Be ready to commit yourself short term and long term. Mm -hmm. And a part of the task of the very, very activist society that we have, as we have millions of activist people across our country, our, our very heavy responsibility now is to, is to, is to focus and come together on a common agenda that is that would be good for the immigration rights movement for the black movement for the JLBT movement for the labor movements for women for, for dealing with poverty we, we have more activism than we've ever had in our country but the whole business of getting directed towards a nonviolent struggle and focusing on the issues and an agenda is an urgent issue. But any individual has to begin where he is. Uh, as I've moved back to Los Angeles, I'm currently trying to figure out where I'm going to put my energy and attention. And, and it has to be, uh, it has to be very focused, and it, and it has to be very directed. So I'm, I'm currently involved in that process. All right, come back to you, Justin, if you want. And I'd also want to extend the invitation. If you're looking for a place to start, we have the Activist Student Coalition, which is 
formed on CSUN campuses, which meets every Monday at 5 p.m. I think there's some flyers at a table. Um, it's Brian okay. Guzman good. here. Hi, right. good, good, good. So, um, thank you. What was your name again? Jason. Jason, I'm Justin. Nice, nice to meet you, you. Justin. Um, okay. I had a question. Um, you yeah. talked about language and um, our nation becoming a community. I think that even on this campus, we struggle with, with um, crossing some bridges. And um, uh, through language, um, you said that um, this is one way, speaking with each other about these issues. Um, on our campus specifically, we've, we, we've had this fight for education. And, and through that, we've sprung the CSUN 6. And then asking, it, I think it was in uh, Martin Luther King's speech about Vietnam, one of his speeches, he said that there comes a time when silence is betrayal. And that now we have the opportunity um, on this campus, just as in the nation, for the administration to speak up in support of education and also support yeah. of those who fight for education, their jobs included. And my question is, what do we say to those people who are timid to join us um, to fight for and protect our First Amendment rights and our human rights to education? How do we, if it's because of their jobs that they're afraid of losing, that we can support you, that um, to, to instill character and not the cowardice that mm -hmm. you spoke about earlier. Everyone hear the question? Well, you know, I, I recognize that so, so often um, an institution doesn't really give the support to student activism to, to the student body as it can or should. And how do you change that? Well, I think you have to sit down and strategize. I think you have to sit down and strategize. Where are the levers of power at CSUN? And can we tap those levers of power? What levers of power and the people who are in that category, how do we reach them? and you strategize to go after them. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I, was, I say you have, to, you have to do. It's not necessarily a, it's not necessarily a, a public effort, mm -hmm. but it may be a one-on-one -on -one effort that takes time and patience. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you, that students have to recognize if they're going to be activists, then they have to help the administration, help faculty understand what the issues are, and in a sense, gently lead faculty and administration to come to your side, become advocates for your position. Thank you. Now, that's a hard... That's a hard answer, but I don't see any other way to do it. I read it. Does anyone see a better way to do it? I mean, building, <clears throat> building the community for social justice is a part of the task, always. Um, I, have, I could maybe have some other specific examples or specific illustrations, but you right. do have to... So maybe a part of the student activism must be to, to right. if brainstorm have, that issue. Right. And we have, um, like I said earlier, the next court date on February 16th, so that gives us about two, three weeks to build those connections with administration and also we, to implement the strategizing that we have done. Um, yeah, good. But, uh, yeah, hopefully, and, and once again, thank you for coming. And that, does, that takes hard work. Institutions have increasingly in the United States learned to follow the examples of plantation capitalism. 
I say that boldly, because we even have it in the churches. <laughs> have it in pastors and bishops. And uh, we, we, we just simply have to strategize how to make the change. And sometimes that's really pretty, one of the toughest pieces of work. But it can be done. All right, yes, sir. Hi, Jamie. Uh, my name is Ricardo, and it's my honor to, to meet you. Uh, right away, it seems that today President Obama is also giving a speech to, to the whole country, to the Union. Should I still believe in him? Because I also voted for him because I believe in change. I don't believe in nonviolence. I mean, I be, you, do believe you hear in the question, do I, should I believe in Obama, right, the president? Yeah. yeah okay. So should I still believe in President Obama and his thoughts that he had during his, um, while he was running for president? And what are your thoughts about the immigration reform? Thank you. Well, I do some consultation with the immigration rights groups around the country. Uh, my brother and I have done this for several years and worked in this field. Um, I, think the hum I think the immigration rights movement needs to move to a nonviolent, protracted struggle in the United States uh, as we began in 2006. And uh, like in Tunisia, plan to come to that place where we'll have millions of people in a hundred cities all across the United States demanding justice and change. I think, we, I think that, that's what has to be. Uh, we, we have to come to that place. The immigration rights movement is one of the places we had a, a good start in 2006. That's one of the places that uh, could ignite uh, a local and a national movement. Um, what was your oh, President Obama I do not believe that you should believe in a President of the United States or a Governor or a Senator or a Pastor of a congregation I believe that you try to make connections with such people and you, you, you have compassion for them um, my wife and I are having a running conversation about President Obama because we, my whole family, supported him when he announced, at the very moment that he announced, and we were mad at uh, a lot of the Democratic, the black Democratic apparatus that did not support him in day one. Uh, and I've said that to some of them myself. A president of the United States, there, there are lots of things about a president of the United States you have to pay attention to. One of them is who the president takes into the White House with him. Who the president appoints to cabinet and to top responsibilities in the government. And I've said this about every president under whom I've lived or with whom I've lived. Obama is following basically a Clintonian form of democratic politics in the Democratic Party. That form of politics is what has helped to lead the country to disaster. It did not work in the last 10 years. It's not going to work now. He's been a far better president than was George W. Bush. There's nothing... That may be saying a whole lot. It may be saying very little. I don't know. Um, he has brought change. The talk show hosts of Fox and the radio are so mad because he's a black man. That means that they have to change the way in which they look at the White House <laughs> and USA official matters. If he's going to meet with Russian leaders or Chinese leaders, here, here it is, a black man. And I'm going to say this because I, I mean it gently, but I mean it, I think I can document it. A lot of white men who are in these positions of power have not dealt with their own human affections. 
they have dealt based upon their posture of power, wealth, and who they know. And so this is an especially hard pill. Some in the Democratic Party, I've read some of, I read the news, you know, from time to time. Well, I do try to read the news almost every day. And I read and I can say to myself, I've said to myself as I've listened to some of the things they have said to Obama or about him, that's racist. They don't know it is. Because racism is normal to them. They have never dismantled the racism in their lives. And I have met white pastors like that in my own denomination for 50 years. <laughs> uh, and know that that's what goes on. So he has brought change in the sense that by having a family like that in the White House, all of the more than 50% of the racist in the society and the sociologists say that over half of the white people of our nation are racist still. 50 million people agree with the Ku Klux Klan theology and racism. So that's, that's still the, you know, what we haven't achieved yet. So we have to understand that he has an intense struggle such as we have never imagined. And um, I personally, will we'll continue to support him, though I criticize him. And if you look at the candidates out of the Republican Party, there isn't a single one of them that's announced who can touch Obama spiritually, family-wise, intellectually, or otherwise. Now, you, 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 we can't get a perfect president. I've never had one. I never expected to have one. So I simply say to you that we're in that tough spot. But if we really want to help Obama, then I'll tell you how we can best help him. Let us ordinary people decide that the way that we change politics is by getting in the street with nonviolent direct action until we build a 21st century movement that puts our agenda in the White House instead of the agenda of the pharmaceutical companies and the Pentagon. That, that's how... <clears throat> that is the most important change affecting the quality of our lives come from marching people, women, workers, and the movement that we call the Civil Rights Movement. Those three movements produce more positive change for the well-being of all Americans than anything else. Um, I mean, you know, we, we have to fuss, but we have to fuss with each other and try to make whatever little gain we can. I mean, imagine, imagine the situation we're in. Uh, uh, president Obama has just recently appointed the president of GE as president of the commission for making jobs. Well, the president of the GE sent 40,000 GE <laughs> jobs overseas. <laughs> Excuse me. Imagine. Um, you know, how, how is the president of GE going to help produce jobs? Can't do it. No, I'm okay, Captain. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's the cold working up. <clears throat> Yes, first of all, I want to thank you so much for a most moving and inspirational talk, Reverend Lawson. It's been, it's been a pleasure working with you during the fall semester, and we look forward to this spring semester working with you for the next three lectures and your workshops. It's been an honor. And we would like to invite you and all our guests here to the reception in the next room. So thank you.